Carlos Tavares, uh, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, the attendants, welcome as well. Welcome on board for this 7 p.m. Auto International Edition with our most distinguished guest speaker, Peugeot's next chief executive officer, who is to take over in full by the end of this month. First of all, let me introduce to you the panel of editors representing four leading business media worldwide, that is to say, Michael Stothard Financial Times, Lawrence Frost Thompson Writers, Thomas Hanke, Germany's Hannes Blatt, and last but not least, Ning Li, Xinhua News Agency. Welcome to you, too. Well, taking into account the number of issues my colleagues are bound to raise, let's start right away with the questions. Carlos Tavares, how do you feel like, after having visited so many factories, offices, and sites, would you say there is more room for improvement than you would ever expected? or less. And despite PS's uh, weak, poor situation in both commercial and financial terms, tell us why it is that you seem so optimistic about the future of your group. Give well, a well, thank you. Thank you, Pierre, for this um, introductory question. Uh, it's, uh, it's true that I have spent most of my time uh, on the ground for the last uh, few weeks. Most of this time dedicated to manufacturing, but not only, also to sales and marketing. And as you mentioned, uh, indeed, I'm very uh, confident that uh, we can pursue the turnaround of the company, seeing the potential that we have in the company, and uh, manufacturing is not an exception to this. I think that we have uh, uh, great people uh, understanding that uh, there is room for improvement. And uh, during all of these days, uh, my uh, concern was to try to help them focus on a limited number of issues so that they can uh, concentrate all of their efforts and deliver results. So indeed, I think your um, introductory question was absolutely uh, on the spot. Uh, I'm quite confident, uh, and I think the company has a great potential. And not only in manufacturing and sales and marketing, many other areas can be improved. Lawrence Frost, Reuters. Yeah, I would like to ask you if you, if you think there's a Renault-Nissan method that you can bring to bear he said at, method. at Peugeot. And, uh, and what it is, I mean, if we're talking about perhaps um, competitiveness benchmarking at plants or pricing, uh, what, what particular lessons from Renault Nissan can you expect to apply at Peugeot? Well, I think it's fair to say that um, since I'm now a, a veteran of the uh, automotive industry with uh, 33 years working in this industry, everything I have learned uh, on those, during those 33 years, I have learned uh, those things with my previous uh, companies. Uh, as you mentioned, Nissan and Renault. So I suppose that somewhere, uh, what I will uh, try to bring to PSA is uh, somewhere related to the lessons I have learned, to the mistakes I have made, and the things that, uh, of course, uh, represent my own personal automotive reference. So from that perspective, I think it would be uh, ridiculous not to say that, indeed, I'm bringing that, that, uh, that experience. But at the same time, um, I completely understand uh, in my future position that nothing can be done without uh, the inspiration that I may have on the people. Uh, it's not because you are the number one that uh, you can always decide everything. It's just because you are in a position where being the number one, you need to have the support of everybody in the company to succeed. Therefore, I think the focus should be in inspiring people to deliver a higher performance and, of course, helping them to see where the potential exists and how they should focus on a limited number of topics to improve their performance. You saw a huge potential for improvement at Peugeot. Um, so, I mean, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about the mistakes you alluded to in, in your past or, uh, or the lessons and what you see, where specifically you see the immediate gains. Well, there are many, uh, many areas, uh, but you know, when, when you go to a plant, uh, regardless of uh, what uh, brand uh, that plant belongs to, uh, you always have the same thing to, to look at. You need to make sure that uh, the quality is made on the main line. You need to look at the, the rework uh, time that uh, you are spending to make the cars uh, meet the quality uh, requirements. Uh, that's one area. Of course, you need to look at uh, uh, how many uh, people you have in your structure, in the management team, to uh, deliver the results. You need to look at how are you managing your suppliers in terms of having a wider scope uh, in evaluating the performance. As you know, 
75% uh, of the uh, overall manufacturing cost of the car comes from the parts we buy from suppliers. So you need to have a very enlarged view of uh, with whom are you working, who is facing problems within your supplier bases, and how can you help them uh, from the plant perspective? How do you go upstream and how you help them to deliver better quality, lower costs, and, and an absolute perfect timing? So all of these things are checklists uh, that you, you need to go through with your management team. And of course, um, in some areas you have breakthroughs that you can see. In other areas you have uh, uh, Kaizen, progressive improvements that you can see. And uh, one factor also which is very important is the lead time. The lead time that you have in a plant, which represents uh, your ability to go through the different steps without bumps, without stop and goes. And all of those stop and goes, as you may imagine, represent uh, penalties in your uh, financial performance for the site. So it's, it's not uh, rocket science. It's just basic things that you need to check with the management team. And because I have uh, the fortune of having some references in my mind, I can quite quickly identify where are uh, the areas where there is uh, things that we should be doing faster because the gap against some of our competitors may be big. Also, you're expecting quite a lot from uh, your low-cost factories and high-cost factories as well. You have well, tremendous potential there. Sure, there, there is potential and uh, there is also the understanding that um, uh, if you look at the different regions in the world, uh, you will notice that approximately 75% to 80% 80, 80 of the cars that are sold in a given region are manufactured in that specific region, uh, which means that if you are selling cars in Europe, most probably 80% of the cars that you sell in Europe are made in Europe. And based on that knowledge, uh, the consequence is that the competitiveness of your plants is mostly restricted to the region where you are producing those cars and selling those cars, which means that uh, in our case, uh, given the fact we have many plants uh, in Europe, uh, we need to be competitive against the other European countries. And also, as Pierre mentioned, we also have uh, uh, plants in the uh, in eastern part of Europe and the southern part of Europe with very competitive costs. Ming Lu Xinhua, a uh, question about question. Dongfeng? Yeah, yeah sure is. <laughs> yeah. You said you, looking, you are looking forward to Chinese markets, and so my question is, how do you profit from the Chinese markets, and how do you make you more competitive in this market? Thank you. Well, uh, indeed, uh, the profits uh, we have from the Chinese market are good. Uh, but as you know, in our industry, nothing is uh, always good enough. But they are good. That's, that's clear. Uh, there is, uh, as we have said, enormous room for improvement. Uh, and the room for improvement comes from the growth, from the profitable growth. Uh, as we have a profitable situation today, each time we grow volumes and market share, of course, it increases the amount of profit that we bring back to the company. And uh, that's why, for China, the focus will be on growth. And for China, the focus will be in working very hard with our partner, Dongfang, to improve uh, the way we are leveraging the local supplier base, make sure that we fully use the competitiveness of the Chinese supplier base, and also making sure that we work together in our common R&D uh, organization to make sure that everything we create from China for the Chinese market will be highly competitive. From there, as you know, our ambition is that we would achieve 1.5 million car sales by 2020, which is, as 1. you know, 1.5 million cars, which is a, a big challenge. Let's recognize that as we have uh, uh, sold a little bit more than the 550,000, 557,000 cars in 2013. So moving from uh, a little bit more than half a million to uh, 1.5 million uh, until 2020, 2020 is, a, is a big challenge. So we'll focus on the profitable growth. And of course, we'll use uh, everything we can for that, uh, including the uh, quality of our partnership uh, with uh, Dongfang. What are you expecting from Dongfang, actually? Well, the, the number one expectation is that Dongfang uh, helps Not us. just money. No, I sure. Guess. Is uh, that they help us understand the Chinese market. You know, the Chinese market is now possibly the most competitive market in the world, which means that understanding the customer expectations in China is now paramount to succeed in sales. Uh, so from Dongfang, uh, one of the 
many things that we expect from our partner is that they help us to understand the customer expectations in China. And of course, another big expectation is that uh, we fully leverage uh, the local Chinese supplier base and that we work in a way that generates uh, spec specifications that can be uh, easily implemented uh, in that country. Lawrence Frost. Aspects of those, which aspects of that plan are beyond the reach of other Dongfeng partners, more casual joint venture partners? Because you, you said last month that you wanted to leverage the privileged partnership with Dongfeng. So I'm wondering what additional benefits your closer relationship brings that other joint venture partners don't have. Well, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I expect that you would ask that question to, to Dong Feng, but... But you do know them uh, quite well. Yeah, I know them you? quite well <laughs> indeed, because yes. this is the third time in my, in my life that I'm working with them. And, uh, and it's, by the way, a big pleasure, because I know them, and uh, they know me. So hopefully we will continue to work in a very open mindset, transparent and, uh, and very, uh, very focused. Uh, I think the, it's a fact that if Dong Feng as um, uh, a share in our, in our company, uh, I think they will be very interested uh, in making sure that uh, this share uh, is uh, part of a company that is creating value. That's why uh, I was saying uh, the other day that uh, I expect this uh, presence of Dong Feng in our capital to be some, some kind of a preferred position uh, of PSA vis-a-vis -vis the, the, other, the other partners. But I think the to answer precisely your question, uh, I think we should talk about the, the depth of a collaboration, depth in uh, the engineering collaboration, depth in the purchasing collaboration, depth in the manufacturing collaboration, and depth in the customer understanding collaboration of the market. So the, the deeper we are in China and the, the, the better we understand what the customers expect, uh, the more efficient we will be. And of course, uh, the, our partner should be the one that helps us go as deep as we should go and, uh, and uh, as uh, precise as we should be. Does that, mean, does that mean sharing more technology than an ordinary joint venture partner might? Why not? So? Why not, of course, of course. Because you've already talked about hybrid air with them, I think, haven't you? Is there, are there any other good examples of? Uh, well, this is, this is one of the examples, but certainly uh, everything which is related to emissions, I think is, uh, is a very, uh, uh, strong common interest between, uh, between uh, our two uh, uh, partners for a very simple reason is that, um, as you know, Europe has been one of the most demanding regions in the world in terms of reducing the CO2 emissions. Uh, it is quite clear that this is now a strong uh, trend, uh, if not an already existing request from the Chinese market. So we can help our partner and help ourselves at the same time because uh, localizing the technology is also a matter of uh, cost competitiveness. Therefore, this is an open avenue for, for our partnership. Does that mean you may sort of uh, reverse or inflect Peugeot's long-standing skepticism about pure electric cars? Well, you know, it's, it's a matter of being on the right timing, mostly. Uh, reducing the emissions, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is a trend that uh, will be long-lasting for the automotive industry. As we all know, um, the automotive industry's responsibility vis-à-vis uh, -vis the emission topic is to bring a solution and stop to be a problem, uh, which means that reducing the emissions needs to be a proactive uh, attitude from the uh, OEMs. And because we are in a partnership, a very deep partnership with, uh, with Dong Feng, we can see that as Europeans we are living in a region which is very demanding on reducing the CO2 emissions, and, and China is becoming one of the most demanding regions also in the world. So uh, we have two uh, home markets who are pulling us uh, in that direction, and of course we can collaborate. Well, the, the question is about electric cars. Uh, Any discussions sorry, about pure electrics in that case? For us, this is not uh, the current roadmap of the company, but reducing emissions is. Yeah, the PSA so, is... Uh, rather lagging in terms of electric cars. Do you see it as an advantage or a setback? Well, you know, so uh, far? I'm not going to contradict myself. Uh, if, oh, that is, <laughs> if, if that is your question, uh, Pierre, I'm not going to contradict myself. I still think that uh, uh, there will be a moment where yeah. having zero emission cars is going to be important. Mm. Uh, but between the current situation zero, you may have different steps. And it is a fact that uh, the current uh, situation of the company 
is more on the hybrid direction, which is uh, an intermediate step that may be uh, more adapted to the current situation, but that doesn't change uh, the final destination. I think the final destination means that the markets and the consumers, if not the regulators, will ask more and more lower emission cars. And electric cars, possibly? It's not something that we should exclude. You're not too, too, too warm about this, huh? as, uh, as well, I feel. It. We, oh, ha we have uh, electric vehicles in our range, if you... Yeah, if but you, you have know. an experience with Renault as well. Sure, the same, sure. Right? Thomas Hankan is that. To continue a bit on the, yeah. the joint venture Let's with Tom Feng, <laughs> a lot of the technologies you use already or you want to apply like the hybrid air is not a pure PSA technology. It depends a, a bit, uh, or it's a joint venture, for example, in this case with Bosch. So we cannot really offer it to Dong Feng, and I think the same is true for other technologies. So what can you, where are you really in the driver's seat and you can say to Dong Feng, here's something we can offer you, and where do you have to negotiate with other partners? Well, you know, negotiating with partners in the automotive industry is, uh, I would say, the usual, the usual situation. And um, I would like to reverse the question asking you, do you think that our German partner would not be interested uh, by additional business in China? I can expect that they would say that they are interested. But of maybe course, you want to, to participate in the negotiation But process. of course, we will have to take into consideration all of that. That's absolutely fair. And uh, we are working in an open manner with, uh, with our uh, different uh, partners and suppliers. So, of course, we will discuss that with them. Michael By the way, Stoffel. I have a meeting with the CEO of Bosch. Very, very Michael Stoffel, yeah. Financial Times. Mm. Um, continuing with the Dong Feng deal, um, I was wondering if you could outline the roadmap for the from Chinese sales of 1.5 million to South, your plans for Southeast Asia more generally in terms of the potential of building a factory there or what your plans are for sales target to there? Oh, it's about 3 million. Well, the major, major, major goal, as, as you said, is, uh, is to make sure that we continue to grow profitably in, uh, in China. Mm. Uh, as you know, we have the project of profitably, building... Profitably, you said. Yes, profitably, absolutely. If not, there is no purpose in selling cars if you don't make profit. But that's, that's the number one goal, is to make sure that uh, we go ahead with our fourth plant uh, in China, that we develop the, the product plan for uh, the different brands that we want to support with, a, with a, some common technology, and that we continue to understand, and I would like to insist on that point, how to better use uh, the local supplier base, the local engineering, and uh, how do we better understand the Chinese customers. Now, if that's a success, if we move in that direction, we have other opportunities in Southeast Asia. And uh, the good thing uh, about our partnership is that we can embrace those opportunities together, uh, which of course will give us a higher investment capability uh, in the region. As you know, uh, with the debt we have today, our investment capability is not very high. So uh, embracing and addressing those opportunities from our GV in China will give us a higher uh, leverage uh, in terms of investment and therefore higher speed to um, uh, try to capture those opportunities in the region, which is one of the benefits of this, uh, of this deal. So will, 26, so will Southeast Asia be a post-2016 uh, driver or, or beforehand? Well, think? not necessarily. It depends on the opportunities and depends on the hardware that you need to implement. You know, the lead time will be most probably the hardware, uh, both uh, product, manufacturing, or any other topic. Uh, as you know, uh, we only have a little bit less than three years now before we reach 2016. So what will make uh, the uh, final uh, date will be the hardware lead time. Mm. But if anything, it would be after 2016. Is that right? Of course, we don't exclude you know, the, the partnership we have with Dongfeng is a long-term oriented partnership. So uh, we are not going to limit ourselves to the next three years. I think it's exactly the opposite. We are going to try to succeed short term in our collaboration in China to make sure that we keep things open and attractive for our teams to come back to us with more proposals. In fact, what I have experienced in the past is that when there is a very good uh, understanding and collaboration and empathy at the top level of the companies, uh, then the people on the ground and middle management, they come bottom up with more proposals because they'll feel that the overall uh, cooperation mindset is, is positive and open 
and they come with ideas, win-win ideas, which is what we expect from this collaboration. Does it mean to say that your long-term target is far beyond uh, 2016? Well, what I would say is that, you know, um, China and Southeast Asia will represent, uh, no doubt, much more than 50% of the worldwide market. Uh, so it means that it, it puts PSA and Dongfang in a very good position to address some of those opportunities. And uh, addressing opportunities with such a strong partner as Dongfang in a, a region that will represent more than half of the world market, I think that's very exciting. Ming Li Xu. Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, uh, evaluate uh, the risk in the group's transfor transformation process? And uh, what is the biggest difficulty or the, bi the biggest risk for you? Thank you. Well, you know, the leading a transformation in a car company is um, always uh, a challenge, but an exciting challenge. I think the the most important thing first is to bring uh, everybody together with the same vision about what we should do and why we should do it and give some purpose to uh, what people are doing. In our case, um, I would say, fortunately, because our situation is so obviously weak in terms of uh, profitability, debt, and free cash flow, I think there is a good understanding in the company that uh, if we don't fix the fundamentals of our financial situation, uh, the future is more problematic than Does if it we fix it. Does it mean to say blood and tears? Well, I don't know how you want to call it. Uh, for me, it's rather inspiring to know that uh, we are in an upward trend and, and have the opportunity to fix it. So I think people feel it that way, at least the people I have met so far. They understand that if we don't fix the fundamentals of the company, uh, then the future is not as bright as it could be if we do. So I think the alignment of the company and the understanding of the company that everything we are doing now is to get rid of our debt, to have a recurrent uh, positive free cash flow and bring the company back to a certain level of profitability, all of this is something that is paramount to give us a better future. Uh, from that perspective, inspiring the company is not as difficult as restructuring a company where the situation is still uh, reasonably good. Uh, and that makes, I would say, from a management perspective, the task easier. But of course, uh, we need to do it in a limited number of uh, years uh, because it has been lasting for several years now and it has to be uh, brought back to a more robust situation. So I would say the, the good news is that uh, people understand that this is a must. And of course, um, the fact that we see or at least I see a certain number of contrast uh, with my previous uh, experiences also uh, gives us the ability to see where uh, you have some room, room of maneuver and room for improvement, which may help us to go faster. Could you name the top three priorities we may have to pave the way to success? Well, I can give you a few. Just three. Sure, uh, let me give you three. Um, the, the first one is to make sure that we allocate resources in a meaningful way. A meaningful way. You know, I have been visiting uh, some of the countries and uh, I have seen that um, we have many, many, many cars in some of the markets where we are losing money. Russia, for example. Russia is an example. Yeah. Where uh, when you have too many cars, you cannot focus. Did you say 25, 27? Yeah, more, more than 25, around yeah. 27. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that Just means that uh, you okay. cannot focus. And if you don't focus in terms of communicating uh, the strength of your product and the strength of your brand to the consumers, if you don't focus, then nothing goes through. And uh, the fact that you fragment your range excessively limits your marketing capability to send the right message to the consumers. So um, bringing back the company to what I would call uh, a more uh, core model strategy orientation is a matter of uh, sales efficiency. It's common sense. Looks common sense. Looks common sense. Looks common sense. Yes. It's a matter of sales efficiency and at the same time, it's a matter of frugality in terms of allocation of resources. So I think we need to focus uh, more and have a stronger product plan oriented work so that in each market we have the right models on a limited number uh, of, of, uh, of models, making sure that you don't waste the resources. So core model strategy allocating of allocation of resources uh, is one of the areas. 
the other area is, uh, of course, making sure that uh, we have uh, enough uh, leverage in terms of pricing power uh, for our products. You know, we have uh, three brands, and uh, the three brands have now a clear positioning. Uh, and I think some of those... You said three brands? I said three, yes. Yes. Peugeot, Peugeot Citroën, Citroën, and a premium brand called DS. DS. So with these three brands, I think we can continue to improve the pricing power of the company, making sure that um, we uh, move away from a, a destructive CNI, uh, which destroy value. And I think the quality of the products, the fit and finish of the products, the attractiveness of the models now sustain a better, can sustain a better pricing power. It's quite obvious, for instance, if you look at the current range of Peugeot, which is a, a three-year average age uh, range, so very, very young, with the 308, with the 2008, the 2008, and the 3008, and very soon the uh, station wagon for the 3, 000, uh, 308. All of these cars are young, fresh, very well designed. And, and attractive. I think they are attractive. And by the way, this is the, the thing that uh, makes me very confident about this company, is that this company knows how to make great cars. Uh, so from that perspective. And as a car guy, you uh, appreciate this? I appreciate that, and you know, I appreciate it. And as I said, on February 19th, I can still have a quite objective assessment of that. So the cars are great, uh, so there is room for uh, leveraging more pricing power. That's the, the second topic. And of, of course, the third topic is all about reducing costs and making sure that uh, we have uh, more competitiveness in our sourcings, more competitiveness uh, in the way uh, we continue to make savings in your fixed costs, in our fixed costs. So all of this... Well, well these are ba bad news for uh, your suppliers. Why should yeah. it be bad news? I mean, reducing costs, what does well, it mean to say? That's what they do every day, you know? Yeah, uh, I know so, that. <laughs> uh, so the point, is, the point is to help them. Uh, the point is to help them how can we work in a more win-win uh, approach so that we can find together more ideas about uh, uh, cost reduction because if you don't have a good uh, cost competitive sourcing, you cannot compete. So at the end of the day, you know, there is no, um, again, it's not rocket science. You have three major things to do when you want to turn around a car maker, reduce your fixed cost, improve our pricing power, you do reduce your variable cost. And one of the things, one of the tools we have, uh, two tools I, I would mention, uh, which for me are absolutely paramount, the first one, as we said, is our uh, partnership with Dongfang in China. That's very important to leverage the local supplier base. The other one is to work in a constructive manner and very uh, concrete manner, pragmatic manner, with our uh, friends from uh, GM and Opel, specifically in Europe, where also we can bundle many things and make sure that we, we reduce our costs. You're still talking GM, General Motors? Yeah, that one. Are you kidding, Mohan? No, we have three programs with them. Did, three programs. Did you forget so far? That? Yeah, we have three, uh, three, three deals. And still existing and sure. Why, why ongoing pro uh, programs. Absolutely. Okay, good news for them, Thomas. You, you, okay. You're talking in a very matter-of-factual way about three brands, but in reality, DS is not really uh, established already as a brand. See how bad is it? Looking a bit to your German competitors, it took about 20 or even more years for Audi to become a, an established brand. How long will it take DS? Well, I appreciate that you asked the question. Uh, first, it's true that Audi took 30 years. 30, no less. Yeah. Uh, and they are a, a, a very uh, successful uh, premium brand. So for us, it's an inspiring success. Uh, secondly, when that question was raised on February the 19th, I said no less than 20 years. So you are right to say that we are working on a 20-year perspective and uh, we will have to uh, be very consistent, very persistent, keep the direction for a long time. Uh, but at the same time, I would also recommend you to visit our DS uh, dealerships in China where already DS exists as a unique premium brand there is no Citroën on the cars, just have the S. And it's uh, somewhere uh, the demonstration of the way we would like to bring that brand up. It will be progressive, it will be step by step, it will be product driven, uh, and you can expect that you will see in other markets in the world the same kind of approach. There's a big difference between China and in, uh, Europe as far as the sure. is concerned. Sure, yeah. there is history. Yes, history. Yeah. And uh, you see uh, things going on uh, like what? Europe. Uh, Take advantage of it or not? 
Well, it it will That's depend. Question, huh? it, it will depend on the on our partners uh, and, uh, and our partners, uh, our dealerships in uh, in Europe. It is quite obvious. If you go today to a Citroen dealership, you will see that you already have at the beginning of uh, a DS corner. Uh, there is the opportunity for most of them if they have a very good performance in the customer service. There is the opportunity. There will be the opportunity to have a, a more visible corner that will move in the direction of uh, putting the uh, premium cars in a specific area in the showroom. And at one point in time, perhaps one day, you have a dedicated showroom. Oh, you mean to say uh, doing it uh, the dash away? No, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying that doing it, uh, may I use the Slowly, Lexus way? Slowly, but very efficiently. May I use the Lexus way? Lexus way, okay. yes. May I use the Audi way? Because I think Audi started with yeah, this. Yeah, but you should add at least uh, three chevrons to make uh, things uh, That's clear. the starting point. That's yeah. the starting point. <laughs> Michael Stafford. Um, two things. Just, just to pick up on the point you made earlier about suppliers. I um, understand one of your successes at uh, Renault was to uh, was just squeezing the suppliers, was delaying the payment times and sort of getting every penny out of them. Um, is that going to be a similar strategy um, here? And is that going to be, is that a big part of what you're doing? No, because I don't think your understanding is correct. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think that that was what we described as what happened in my previous experience. I think it's exactly the opposite. Um, I think the only way to work with suppliers is to work on concrete stuff, which means if you want to reduce cost, let's try to optimize the specs, let's go in the workshop, let's look, let's look for inefficiencies. For instance, uh, you have too much diversity and complexity that is penalizing the workshop. Uh, if you are losing the opportunity to use a common part which is uh, already used by some of your competitors because you have a specific spec that is moving you away from what the supplier is already doing, uh, or because you have a specific demand that eventually your customer does not value, but creates a lot of free work in the supplier workshop. So I believe the only way to work with our suppliers, because you know, those are companies like ours, they are struggling for their own profitability, for their own sustainability. So what is really sustainable is to work on concrete, pragmatic stuff, which is rework, diversity, complexity, efficiency, in the workshops. And, uh, you know, as a coincidence, um, today I'm spending the day with our purchasing team. I just stepped out to come here. And uh, the spirit in which we are working is, uh, of course, this one. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, it is fair to say that our level of demand is very high and will continue to be high. And why uh, will it continue to be high? Because it is in the best interest uh, of our suppliers that we express a very demanding uh, position, which is, by the way, the market demand, right? Our customers are looking for higher quality, more comfort, more safety, uh, lower emissions, and lower, lower price. That's what our customers are asking us. So uh, we have, uh, with our partners, to face the reality of the market. But of course, uh, the fastest way to get there is to work with them, not against them. So uh, being in a partnership attitude, uh, high level of empathy is what we want to do. Uh, and of course, that's why I was mentioning the fact that it's so important to work with Dongfang and with Opel, because in both cases, we can give our suppliers a wider business. And if it's a wider business, then on their side, it's going to be also easier to find profitability. Yeah, to come back on, on, oh, your, on your cost cutting uh, plans. Um, so you say you've toured factories and identified immediate gains that the ones that are easily overlooked that stop short of full restructuring, but sort of productivity gains and, and, and so on. Um, PSA had identified 1.5 billion euros of savings and has says it's, it's already achieved three fifths of that, I think. Would it be reasonable to expect with you coming along that uh, that target will be exceeded? Well, I don't know. It's uh, too soon for me to say. Um, but uh, one thing you can be sure of is, uh, as you know, um, I'm not the kind of guy who's going to stop at the objective because he has reached the objective. Uh, what is important is that uh, we make sure that we have in the company uh, the competitive mindset that gives uh, PSA the ability to have a sustainable business, which means uh, a profitable business. So uh, we'll see uh, in 2016 where we are. Uh, if we have the opportunity to go beyond, why should we stop? 
uh, what, what is important. But on the face of it, you do, because these are additional measures that you've identified since arriving. Um, isn't that a fair supposition? I think you, you need to um, uh, somewhere recognize, uh, as I do, that many things have already been kicked off by my predecessor and by the management team. And uh, I want to respect that, first because it's a reality, uh, therefore, uh, it is very difficult to break down precisely what has already been kicked off, what has not been kicked off. On the things that have been kicked off, my, my action will be to try to accelerate as much as we can the implementation. On the things which are new ideas, then we'll kick off new ideas and try to enrich the panel of things that we can do, but uh, always keeping in mind that focus is uh, paramount for the rigorous implementation and getting the job done. So. Um, at this stage, uh, after a few weeks in the company, it's very difficult for me to say what is new, what is acceleration. But sure, uh, once we inspire the company in moving to a direction where we turn around the company and make, make it healthy and profitable, uh, then if we are in a good trend, why should we stop? But uh, at the same time, I think uh, as you are an expert of this industry, you know that nothing is simple in implementation. And uh, in, a, in an automotive company, the car company, Having the idea is fine, but getting the job done is much more difficult than having the idea. So focus on implementation is, is what we would like to do for the next three years. I raise a question a different way. Um, do you see any necessity to make some kind of disruption with uh, your predecessor, with uh, Philippe's policy? Is, is, it, is it a necessity? I mean, on French grounds. Because French do love change. Too much, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, to answer that question in a fair way, first, uh, I think we, we need to recognize, and uh, please do that because uh, I think we need to be very fair. We need to recognize that in 2013, the results have been far better than in 2012. I think that's, that's fair to say. If you look at all the metrics, all the financial metrics, all of them uh, show that we are moving the right direction. And that is because my predecessor and the management team has done with the whole company some of uh, uh, very good things. On the good things that have been launched, most of them are good, I can tell you. Uh, the only focus for us is how can we do them faster if we can, right? Now, uh, again, um, surfing on this uh, turnaround direction uh, if we can add some other directions, some other stuff we will do, uh, one of the things that uh, you have seen, which is very important, is that we turn around our Russian business and we turn around our South American business, which are creating red ink so far. Uh, and that's something that is still to be done. And that will help enormously the company moving forward. So my mindset is, is very simple. First of all, uh, I recognize that 2013 was a much better year than 2012. And that's a fact. That's financial results. Secondly, uh, I see that most of the things, if not all the things that have been so far kicked off, are moving the right direction. So my added value on those things will be to make them deeper or faster, but certainly not to change the direction. Third, if I can find other ideas uh, and get the job done in, in some of the things which are not done at this stage, like the turnaround of Russia and Latin America, of course I will do that. And that may bring us to what you have just said. If we can go fur further, why should we uh, avoid the opportunity to do it? Anyway, the transition with uh, Philippe Bar is uh, going on uh, very smoothly. Very smoothly because... Very elegant, would well, I say. Elegant, I appreciate that, but the most important is the efficiency for the company. Yeah. The elegant, yes, uh, the relationship between Philippe and myself. Oh, I, well, I was mentioning uh, the KV uh, false uh, history. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, I was too young yeah, at that point. It's quite different. <laughs> okay. I don't remember that, that period. But I want, to, I want to confirm that things with uh, Philippe are, are moving very well, uh, mm -hmm. very smooth, very respectful. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that the only focus we have, both of us, and this is uh, the only thing that counts it's for the company. Is good. Is make sure that the company is uh, moving forward and that we have a rolling start, not a standstill start. Mili, yeah. Chinois. Uh, 
you have talked about uh, DS series. Um, I mean, as I know, you developed this, uh, this series with another partner, uh, Chang'an uh, Automobile. And uh, how is the partnership with this, this uh, uh, Chinese company? And will the Dongfeng will involve in another uh, program to bring up the, the brand in China in Chinese market? Well, as you know, um, in other words, will you leave, force them to leave uh, their Renault partnership? Right? No, not quite. <laughs> no, I, I think I understood the question. Uh, yes. as, as you know, um, we have two different uh, joint ventures, uh, DPCA and, and CAPSA. Uh, th those are separate joint ventures with two different partners. By the way, I don't think we are the only ones in China to have two different uh, GVs, as you know well, because you know it better than I do. Uh, so it's not a specific position for us. Uh, last time I, I was in China very recently, I met uh, the two presidents of the two, uh, the two companies, and uh, I can tell you that the quality of the relationship seems excellent. And you know what makes it excellent is the fact that in both cases we want to generate more profitable growth. And as long as we are moving forward, uh, I think it will be that way, uh, is uh, generating more technology, more product, more plants, more market share, and profitable market share. So um, I think this is uh, just a situation where we will be able to leverage the best of our two partnerships. And of course, uh, I expect them to be very demanding on ourselves. And that's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I, I feel very good about that. But because the more demanding they will be on ourselves, the better the results will be in China or even uh, somewhere else. So uh, I think that, that level of demand, respectful demand, for me, it's, it's very good. Thomas Hanke, Hansbad. A lot of guesswork is going on, actually, on the future governance of the, the company. And inside PSA, people generally expect you to be the person who is bringing together the interests of the new shareholders with the old shareholders. So tell us a little bit, how are you going to ride the three-headed line? We are puzzled so far. OK, so let me try to clarify. Um, First, I think it is, it is uh, fair to say that uh, the three uh, major shareholders you are mentioning have all the same interest, which is to make sure that we create value. For our company to create value, uh, we need to turn it around and make sure that we generate recurrent uh, free cash flow and uh, profitability, reduce the debt. So I think the, the metrics for creating value for our shareholders are quite, quite well understood and quite well accepted. So uh, from that perspective, uh, I feel very, very comfortable. I know that uh, they will recognize that what we have to do now is exactly what I've just mentioned. And frankly, I don't see why any of them would have another interest than this one. I think it's quite obvious, at least from all the discussions I have so far, that everybody wants PSA to come back on track. Everybody wants PSA to be back in the race not only uh, catch up with the other guys, but try to overtake a few of them. Uh, so that, that, that for me is, is rather positive. Uh, I don't see uh, any risk. And of course, um, perhaps you would, uh, you would ask me, well, but you have three major shareholders, which is, which is a fact. Uh, at the same time, if you look at the, the way the uh, supervisory board is going to be, to be made, uh, I think the diversity, the diversity of the supervisory board can lead to uh, better uh, decisions, as it is the case for any managing board of any car company. Generally speaking, when you look at the managing board of a car company, and if you look at the diversity, what would you say? Probably the same thing as me. You would say the more diverse the managing board is, or the, the, the executive committee is, the better chance you have to make great decisions because you have different perspectives, good debate. All right, but it is the first time, the very first time, that uh, the Peugeot family is no more in control. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't make the difference on the fact that the Peugeot family is sincerely and eagerly looking for the turnaround of the company. Uh, so I don't think this is going to make any, any problem because they want the company to be turned around. So to finish my sentence, I would say that in an executive committee or a managing board, we would say that diversity is a factor for better uh, decisions in terms of quality. And it's Chinese directors on the board, or what does it mean? 
No, it means that on the supervisory board, by having the three shareholders represented, mm -hmm. the quality of the discussion and the quality of the decisions that will be made will be enriched from the fact that there is higher level of diversity. So I feel that as a strength rather than a, a threat as Perhaps your question was on the city. Lance Frost, writers. Actually, I wanted to ask about something else, but a quick follow-up perhaps first. I mean, is it important in that regard to have an independent chairman? He said independent chairman. Yeah, I think And what does that mean, for, as far as you're Well, concerned? that is very uh, clear in any corporate governance in the world. I mean, you can ask this uh, for, to Could any Louis expert. Could Galois be an independent chairman? It means it needs to be independent from the interest of the... Uh, major shareholders. Well, a former civil servant who was appointed to the Peugeot board by the government, could he now be an independent chairman? That's not, not to me to decide. That's not my job. No, this is a great, great experience in working you, with the you have a, state. You have, a, you have a stake in it, though, don't you? I mean, you want a, a governance that works. Do you have a preference as to the way the, chair, the chairmanship should work? No, my, my position is much more relaxed than, the, than what your question suggests. You do look relaxed. I am relaxed. Uh, <laughs> I am relaxed for a very simple reason. This, this PSA company has tons of potential. Uh, uh, plenty of great people. And possibly your ultimate ambition. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, older now than I was before, that's for sure. But uh, what I would say is uh, the company has uh, the ability to make great cars. Uh, the people are very talented. Uh, I think uh, some of the good strategic things have been done. Uh, we have now a new shareholding to give us the capital we need for the investment for the future. Yes, so, but you, you, you said the two less, uh, two less marketing and too much uh, engineering. Sure. I mean, if, if, if you have any, any guy, um, any number one of a car company telling you that uh, everything is done, please don't believe him. <laughs> please don't believe right. him. So I'm, I'm quite relaxed with the supervisory board. I think we will have uh, great people having uh, healthy discussions. And of course, one of the challenges for the chairman of the supervisory board will make sure will be to make sure that there is good debate, good discussion to enrich the decisions, as much as I will have to do the same in my managing board to make sure that I use diversity to bring to the table better decisions. Michael Sturford, Financial Times. Um, just two quick things on the management. Um, you say that everyone is in line, everyone wants to get the company back to profitability. And I can, I can understand that. But do you not think that there's a, there's a chance that post-2016, post, post 2016, um, when your union agreement runs out, some people are going to think that in order to restore profitability, you'll need to do more capacity cuts in France or in Europe, uh, for example, whereas the French state might think that was a very bad idea. And Moscovici said, it's a strategic stake. We're here to, prevent, uh, to protect French jobs. Do you not think that at that point, um, there could be a divergent entrance between these three big forces on the, on the board. And the answer is oh no. <laughs> and, and, and there's a second question, which is to what extent you've been, um, you've been sort of given any guarantees of autonomy and guarantees of that the, these three forces won't basically meddle, meddle with what you want to do? Well, uh, first, to, to make it simple, um, I think that there is a way to work with your shareholders uh, to make sure that uh, you have the opportunity to express what you think you need to do and, uh, and you work with them. Uh, when I was working in my previous company, uh, I had the opportunity to work with the French state and, uh, and uh, I learned from that. And I learned how, what's the process by which you can discuss things and, uh, and, and get agreement on things. So um, this is something uh, possibly that I can bring to PSA as uh, how do you work with the French state uh, on the issues that you have mentioned. Uh, this being said, uh, again, uh, I don't think that in three year, in a three year period, uh, value creation will no longer be the point of focus. Uh, because in, in three year, if the turnaround is a success, what we will be discussing about? We will be discussing about the ranking of our company vis-a-vis -vis the other car makers, and we will be discussing about how vulnerable are we or not, depending on the ranking. So, you know, moving forward and uh, creating uh, conditions for a competitive car company is something that never stops. So we'll continue to work. Uh, I would like also to highlight the fact that from everything I understand, uh, the French state is coming to our company as an investor, as a, an investor that wants to 
get a higher value from its investment at one point in time. So again, everything brings back us to the same line, which is how do we create value and beyond the turnaround of the company, which means reducing the debt, getting profitability back and the recurrent positive free cash flow, uh, how do we move up in the ranking of the different car makers? I think that will be the second step. So in short, you don't think it will be a problem with the French state stopping you if you decided that productivity, you needed to reduce capacity in Europe um, in order to foment this expansion abroad. You don't think the French state would, would meddle in that? I think it is it's part of my job to explain to our shareholders where are the levers for profitability, where are the levers for sustainable, profitable growth. That will be part of my job and uh, I will do it, of course. Uh, and then we'll see. But everything that we have seen so far from the presence of the French state in our competitors' board uh, seems to indicate concretely that uh, things can be done. Because if you look at our competitor, they are making money and uh, they, they have the state as one of their shareholders. Lawrence Frost, writers. Since, since we talked about the elegance of the, the elegance of the Carlos Philippe relationship, perhaps we could talk about the Carlos Carlos relationship. Um, I was wondering in particular what the, how this might affect the potential for cooperation between Renault and Peugeot, which has been pretty limited historically. But I mean, first to understand that, maybe we need to understand a bit, a little better, what happened last year around your exit from, from Renault. Uh, and the question uh, it really is: um, if it hadn't been for that interview to Bloomberg, um, would you be here today? Would you have found your way to Peugeot, or would they have found their way to you? Or would you still be at Renault? Well, you know, the, the only thing we, we should um, uh, say about that topic is that uh, both uh, Carlos Ghosn and myself uh, are professional people. Uh, and uh, it is quite clear that it is uh, in the interest of both of our companies that we get along properly. And that, uh, that should be easy uh, because uh, the decision that we took uh, last year was a common decision. And that we took that decision to make sure that the company would not be hurt. Uh, and I think we should be, both of us, proud of the decision and the way we made the decision, uh, always protecting the company. Uh, from that perspective, uh, you can expect from me uh, in the future that uh, we will have with Carlos Ghosn a very good relationship, very professional, very cordial, uh, so that we can make sure that our companies uh, continue to progress and make sure that the French automotive industry as a whole is also going to progress from the quality of our relationship. So that's the only thing I have to say on that matter. The fact that one executive changes company in his career is not an event. But now you both have, you both have the French uh, state as on the front row of your, of your board. Um, and that's the first time we've seen that for Renault and Peugeot. Can we expect perhaps more cooperation? I mean, there's a government-backed um, autonomous driving program that GONA is very active in now. Is that something you would uh, adhere to or join up? Um, are there other opportunities where we might see the two companies cooperating more? I, I would like to, to tell you that um, there is um, an organization uh, in France called the PFA, uh, which is uh, the place where uh, the suppliers and the car makers work together uh, to set the stage for their collaboration inside of the French automotive industry. And within that, that organization, we already have common programs, common advanced engineering programs with Renault, which, by the way, are progressing quite well because the heads of the two engineering entities get along very well and it, it's very fruitful. Uh, so within that organization, the PFA organization, uh, of course, there is room for more collaboration. And we are very open to that. Uh, again, everything that makes uh, PSA move further uh, forward uh, and uh, there is a win-win situation with our French competitor. There is no reason why we should not collaborate. And it is in my intention to focus on the PSA turnaround. And if to accelerate the PSA turnaround, there are opportunities to collaborate, of course, uh, we should address them. With the French state and Dong Feng in your capital, uh, could you join someday the Renault-Nissan alliance? Well, that's a uh, 1 billion euro question, right? Yeah, one yeah. billion. Uh, That's my question, anyway. I'm, I'm not <laughs> my smart. obsession, will I say? I'm not smart enough to answer that question. Too too expensive for me. But you know, uh, it, it is quite simple. Uh, you know, the roadmap for us is 
three years, turn around the company, then we'll address I, I got other it. things. You got but it. You, you, you're thinking long term as well. Yes, of course. I have my own ideas, but I think it's too soon to talk about too it. Too soon? To, right. No comment so far. No comment. Thomas? You showed at Renault a huge ability to, to develop and build smaller, affordable, but nevertheless very interesting and attractive cars. But up to now, you have, have not shown your ability to develop bigger premium brand cars. What will we see from, from you in that respect? I think it's a fair, it's a fair statement. Um, I could oppose by saying that uh, uh, with my friends from Nissan in a five-year period, uh, we launched 50 cars uh, in five years. And 50, uh, 50 with, uh, with my friends from engineering and design and product planning uh, when I was working in Japan. And among those, many of them were Infinities. Uh, so I, I could oppose that. But I think uh, your statement is still very fair. And uh, this is something I want to learn. And, uh, uh, I am very excited uh, about the people we have in design and engineering. Uh, and if you look at some of the Peugeot cars, uh, Citroën cars and DS cars, you'll find there is the, the beginning of that story. Uh, but uh, I would certainly agree that uh, there is room for improvement and that's what we are going to work on. Gentlemen, a very last question. Michael? Two, two quick ones. Two quick um, ones. <laughs> two, two, two quick ones. Um, one, just about uh, Latin America and Russia and turning around profitability there. Are there one or two details you could give us about um, sort of key areas that need to be turned around or key, just key just little, little targets you have? Um, and also one, again, sort of related, um, one of the problems obviously everyone talks about with Peugeot is being sort of subscale, essentially, you know, not, not producing enough cars. Um, when... When, where, where in the rankings of the, of the sort of top 10, I believe you're sort of number nine, I believe, um, where in the rankings do you feel you should be by 2016? Or where do you feel you need to be um, to be a profitable car company? You know, um, let me answer the second question first. Um, size is not um, a relevant goal. Size is the consequence of a well-done job. So uh, at this stage, um, I don't think that we should be contemplating an objective in size, meaning on size of sales, because you know, we are, a, to make it short, a three million car company. Um, but we can be a three million car company, which could be, in your assessment, better than a 2.5 million, million car company. But if we are creating red ink, what's the purpose, right? So uh, the size by itself is not the relevant, uh, the relevant uh, metric. I think first you need to make sure that you create... It doesn't sound very French. Well, we, we tend to be a global car maker. At least we try to be a global car maker. Good. We answer. still have some room for improvement. Good but to, fin to finish with my, my answer, uh, first make sure that you focus on reducing the debt, increasing your free cash flow, getting profit. And That's from there... money, money and money. Yes. Why not selling for a year, for example? Because that's not, that's not mine, that's cash. It's not profitability. You know, there is a big difference by, between putting uh, cash in the bank and generating profit. It's, it's uh, not the same, exactly the same thing. And it's true that we need cash to uh, protect the future in terms of investment, yes. but that future will be only protected if after the cash we generate profitability to create the conditions for a uh, a good uh, financing for the next step. So the first question was about, about Russia. So answer to your second question, size is not the metric for at this stage. Yeah. At, this at this stage, stage. bring back the company to a healthy situation. To the first question, I will give you two examples. Uh, the first example is that we are generating red ink in Russia and we have 27 models on sales, which means the number of cars is not, is not the problem. Uh, so the size of the range is not the right metric for generating profitability in a given market. Rather, the core models that you need to have in that market are the key question. Second example, uh, we have two C sedan uh, models uh, that we uh, make locally in our, in our plant in Kaluga. It happens that we have two C sedans, C segment sedans for the two brands. And uh, one could question why do you have two cars in the same segment uh, for the two brands of your same company, which of course is, is one way to see it. Last one. Low yes. cost cars. Um, you, you're exploring low cost cars with Dongfeng, I believe. Uh, 
what is, I mean, the, 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 the need for low-cost cars goes beyond Asia, though, doesn't it? I mean, we've seen that Renault's uh, results have been largely supported by the success of the, the entry range, particularly in Central Europe and Russia and around the Mediterranean and so on. Um, is that something that you would want to replicate eventually? Uh, the new sites you're talking about on the margins of Europe, the fact the possible factory, would that purely be for small cars or would that also have a low-cost car, low car output? No, we, we are not uh, going to implement uh, a low-cost uh, car strategy. This is uh, not what we need to do in the, in the short and medium term. What we need to do is to improve the competitiveness of our sourcings. Uh, that's something that needs to be done because the consumers are asking for lower prices. It's a fact. Now, you can look at the lower prices either from a sticker price perspective or from a uh, a net price perspective, which is the invoice after the discount. But in both cases, the, the pressure from our customers is, is quite high, which means that for us, the priority is to improve the cost competitiveness of our sourcing. But at the same time, I think we need to recognize that we have two great brands with a long history. And uh, I think it is uh, more important for us to leverage the long history, the roots of the two brands we have, uh, not to talk about the premium one, which is a young one, but uh, on the Peugeot Citroën side, uh, these brands are very, very uh, deep. And uh, I think at this stage, what we need to do is to leverage this history, these roots, to improve the pricing power, and at the same time, improve the cost competitiveness of our sourcing in order to restore, again, profitability. Uh, we'll see later if we need another strategy but for the time being, I think that strategy is enough. And please keep in mind what I have said from the beginning is focus, focus, focus is the norm. Before leaving, just the very last question. Back to uh, August 29th when you left Renault. Was it really a booby trap? Or maybe some kind of clever move on your side to live your fate? Burning your ships. Well, you know, uh, Pierre, I really appreciate that question. You know, <laughs> uh, like our friends here, um, in, in any story, in any story, uh, you need to have a mystery. And you have to learn to live with that one. Thank you. <laughs>